This is going to freak you out. I think. What is that? This is a Jerusalem cricket that you can find <laughs> find in the mountains around here. <laughs> I've been obsessed with insects, like you know, fanatically since I was seven years old. I used to keep scorpions, tarantulas, giant African land snails, hissing cockroaches, katydids. My name is Joe Parker. I'm an assistant professor at Caltech and I'm an entomologist, so I study insects. And the question that really interests me is how do different species of organism evolve the capacity to interact with each other? The group of organisms that I study are really the, kind of the world champions for evolving uh, symbiotic associations and these are the rove beetles so they don't look like much because they're very small but under the microscope they're absolutely the most beautiful thing and repeatedly during their evolution they've evolved to become symbiotic inside colonies of ants and termites. Probably the evolution of this unprotected flexible abdomen is that it probably selected for the evolution of a defensive gland okay so you know you're not physically protecting your abdomen anymore you're chemically protecting it you evolve a gland at the tip and so if something like an ant wanders up to you you can loop the flexible abdomen over and you know hit the ant in the face with your chemical weapon what this meant was these beetles had this kind of innovative body plan and they were also this kind of chemical factory and so some species that became symbiotic Rather than producing nasty compounds from these glands, they produce compounds that can behaviorally manipulate the ants. So ants will approach these beetles aggressively, they'll loop their abdomen over and produce something that ants appear to find very attractive. But there are species that bite onto the ants' antenna with their mouth parts and they use that to anchor their body on top of the ant's head and then they use their legs to groom the ant and transfer the cuticular pheromones onto their own bodies. So there's some species that are also fed mouth to mouth by the ants and they seem to graze also on the surfaces of the ants. This is something we're really interested in. And, and if you keep the beetles away from the ants for, you know, 10, 12 hours, they're dead. So they're absolutely dependent on the ants. What predisposes creatures to become symbiotic and then what happens you know, genomically, genetically, developmentally, neurobiologically, as they move towards a fully symbiotic existence. You're not just studying quirks of the animal kingdom, you're asking a fundamental question about how organisms recognise members of their own species. How do we recognise ourselves as a unitary species as distinct from the rest of nature? And these beetles have like this amazing capacity kind of break through that and start interacting with the members of another species. An entomologist can come to Caltech with an interesting system like this and then you're suddenly surrounded by people with expertise and tools that can help you transform it into something super fascinating. So you can take entomology into really amazing directions by coming to a place like this.